Um, the, and the authority is the public body created by the General Assembly to be responsible for this economic development opportunity. But they charge recognizing that partnerships among businesses and research partnerships with businesses at institutions of higher education, both public and private, were really not matters for government to be involved in or for government to control. We knew that it was important for there to be a private entity, uh, a not-for-profit, in which those activities could take place. Discussions of research opportunities, discussion of workforce needs, um, discussion of, of policy issues that, that are important. And so the authority was given the charge to create that private entity, that private not-for-profit corporation who essentially would do the day-to-day -day work around advancing and supporting the nuclear energy industry in Virginia. Um, so it is really as envisioned um, that the consortium is the active body, the most active body, and where most of the regular meetings and discussions and partnerships and activities will be developed and take place. Um, and the authority will be the group who will perhaps charge the consortium and say, here are our priorities for you, um, and sit and receive reports from the group, um, maybe twice a year uh, or more often as needed. And I think all of this, when we get later in the agenda to the point which is um, goals and objectives and discussing those, we can sort of see in practical terms how those two things divide out. Um, but really the conception was that it's the consortium that's the critical piece. The consortium where all of the private companies uh, who live and work in Virginia make jobs, great jobs for Virginians, um, are worried about continuing to develop their work workforces. I know the last time we were together, um, Mike Grencheck from Arriva leaned over and said to me, before I left today, I signed 30 retirement letters. I don't know where the people are coming from to replace those individuals in those jobs. Um, and those people should come from Virginia. They should not have to come from somewhere else in the country. Or we risk losing uh, this economic development sector, these great companies, to other states. Um, so unless folks have questions, um, that's my summary of the difference between the two. I hope it's helpful. Very helpful to me. Questions, guys? Great. That's, thank you so much, Marina. I think that provides some clarity that even I myself was wondering if I had completely down. <laughs> <laughs> Often in our discussions, you would see this sort of intermittent interrelationship between the consortium and the authority, and it wasn't really clear exactly where that line was drawn. So thank and, you. and the technical piece that's important is that all of the statutory limitations, um, whether it's procurement or FOIA or how monies are handled and kept, all of those apply to the authority, the authority they only? and the authority only. They specifically pursuant to the statute do not apply to the consortium so that it can work as a private entity, private not-for-profit, um, really a business sector association, but that includes higher ed and not-for-profit groups and whoever is recruited. So then the consortium would be meeting, not necessarily in a public venue and creating your documents and processes and and work products that are bringing to us based on the charge from the authority who's the interface between the consortium and the government. Okay. Excellent. So that, if there are no more questions on our on uh, topic one, then let's move on to topic two, which is our articles of incorporation um, to discuss where we are with those. I know they were sent out some time ago, several months, and uh, Randy, do you want to take that? Um, actually, this was a bylaws for the full uh, the full authority that are passed out for, uh, I think the Maureen can give an update on incorporation. <laughs> okay. Sorry, the, the, the articles of incorporation are really um, a, a pretty straightforward technical legal document that the consortium will have to file at the State Corporation Commission um, that creates, if you will, the private entity um, that will be the consortium. Um, we have recruited um, pro bono legal help to represent the consortium, and I say the consortium because it's important they will not be representing the authority. The Office of the Attorney General does that. Um, but he will represent the consortium in filing those articles of, consor of uh, incorporation. Um, I'll share with you, it's a great guy. Um, Jim Guy is the chair of the energy practice group at the Claire Ryan. 
Uh, he was also just elected to serve as president of the Board of Governors of the Virginia Bar Association. He's an exceptional lawyer. He is also an exceptional musician. And he is, uh, he leads an Irish band that is ceasing its 20 year existence this week. And so for the last 10 days, he just, he's just been out of pocket. I can't get him. <laughs> um, this being St. Patrick's Day. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Um, so I have, it, they really are very simple. They can be as simple as just filling in the blanks on a form from the State Corporation Commission. Um, we will need to fill in our first founding directors. We won't. The consortium will need to fill in its first founding directors. So I will say, Randy, as I was looking at everything this morning, we, we may want to push the articles yeah. to after recruiting yeah. so that you can fill in those founding directors on the articles of incorporation. Yeah. Um, and then you can include as much or as little. You know, you can draft articles of incorporation that are more detailed than the fill in the blank form. Yeah. And that really will be between that initial founding group, I think, uh, and Jim, in terms of, of uh, how that gets done. So, um, whereas I think in our discussions we've thought of the articles as an initiating activity, yeah. I think actually it is better, now reflecting on it, that it becomes sort of the first thing that that founding board does, especially after Randy's good work developing that timeline of how to get that group in place. Okay. Um, and, right. and I don't know, some folks in this room have had some experience doing things like this, so jump in if, if that doesn't sound right. Yeah, actually, I have incorporated a nonprofit to the state some 10 years ago. You need to have a director's first before okay. you can do that. Good. that done. But the articles of the incorporation of the consortium have to be in place before we establish the consortium. Um, it's sort of I mean, a chicken really a and egg question. thing. I'm not sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's sort of a chicken and egg thing, and I don't intend this to be legal advice because I, I can't rep I can't give legal advice here. But it is the creation of the legal entity okay. that is the consortium. Um, so you can create a group. I mean, anybody can create a group and adopt bylaws. There are lots of groups that have bylaws that operate that aren't corporations. Um, but because the consortium has the authority to engage in all sorts of activities that are business-like, um, incorporating, and because the statute says so, um, incorporating as a not-for-profit is a good thing to do. It gives you a registered agent. It you know, gives you a, a, uh, a structure and a substantial legal existence so that people can do business with you. The only thing I was concerned about was the statute establishing both the authority and the consortium before we began to task the consortium and the consortium began to interface with the authority and giving us reports. I would think we'd have to have incorporation of that consortium so that we could demonstrate to the state we had followed yes. uh, a path. Yes. Okay, that's all I meant by that. All right. yeah. John, can I interject something? Uh, actually, I'm going to talk about Sunrise Consortium, which later we did that uh, a few years back as uh, a Southeast. Universities consortium. Uh, I think we, what we did, we put together articles first as a group. We, we did all the preparatory things, and then we uh, applied for a, a nonprofit organization. We have to do that prior to. Well, but you have to get the group together yes, first. Yes, the group. Right. We had a group. That's right. We had a group. We got to get the group. Yeah, yeah. 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 group. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but but I assume the group should come from us. Huh? Well, actually, it I can't come to that. Actually, it can't okay. come from us. <laughs> uh, you can't well, be a member of the authority and a member of the consortium. Okay. That doesn't mean a member You're of your organization, organization can't be a member. That's what I meant, organization. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It could be other people. So I think that really brings us then, given the fact that we're at some point we're going to have to be given guidance as consortium, the consortium that we're going to talk about how we're going to form during the course of this meeting this morning. So the next one would be the timeline to establish the consortium. Yeah. I think that to get it. Yeah. Um, basically, what I this is the, the for the first thing on the right hand side of your of your, of your document. Basically, just kind of 
the back of the envelope dates and plan on how to of, of, of timelines for us to hit here. Basically today, the kind of our goal was to approve to um, uh, approve a timeline, the responsibilities, assignments between what's the consortium, what's authority, and to talk about what's the what's the, what the most important thing we do today is talk about what's the what's the proposal to, to find founding board members. Um, and so today, if it, if we can get through those things, make our recommendations to the full authority board meeting, which should look like it's going to be on the 21st of April, then they approve those uh, recommendations, amend them as they see fit. Um, and then um, also on the 21st, we're going to have um, kind of a letter from the authority to other consortium that kind of outlines some of, some of the authority's um, kind of goals and visions for what we, for, uh, what we should be doing. Um, uh, as a consortium, and then kind of that April to June period to recruit members, because since not just because we not because we need not just people to be serve as you know members to serve for the articles, but also you know we need to actually recruit actual members of the consortium, um, uh, so they can form their board, form their bylaws, and to eventually hire an ED and staff and the budget and stuff like that. So we kind of see that April to June period as member. A recruitment time, uh, and then for a meeting for the consortium to have June, July, uh, and then that's when they can establish their bylaws, have their board members in place, uh, approve a budget, and that's a place where they're able to do it, and then put out the call for them to then hire an ED and staff. So that's just kind of my back of the envelope, um, uh, you know, ideas. I wanted to have a baseline for the members to be able to work off of. Um, there is no pride in authorship, so please feel free to amend and change it as you all see fit. Do you thoughts, Mary? Or? I, th I think this looks good. Mm -hmm. I, you know, we've been through this process a couple of times with our uh, Commonwealth Center for Advanced Manufacturing yeah. as well as the Commonwealth Center for Advanced Logistics Systems, and very similar process yeah. that we follow there. Yeah. So, uh, this looks very reasonable. Yeah, yeah. Barry, and maybe the members of, of those groups were already well defined, but can you talk to us a little bit about your thoughts on recruiting members and, and thinking about maybe, I don't know whether it's tiers of memberships, types of members, because members really are going to be the initial source of any funds that the consortium has to work with and to hire staff. So. Yeah, and we, in the case of CCAM, the, the Advanced Manufacturing Center, we had three founding members, um, University of Virginia, Virginia Tech, and Royal Force were the three founding members. But, um, and that, so that group actually you know, developed the articles of the corporation, developed the initial set of bylaws, had the initial directors for the organization. Um, and, and it was structured as a you know, Virginia non-stock corporation, but as a membership organization. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we have um, multiple levels of membership. Uh, there are uh, so-called founding or organizing university members, uh, founding or organizing companies, uh, industry members, and then we have tier one, tier two, and tier three industry memberships. And each of those So are there levels, more members of CCAM now? <coughs> uh, we have 22 members of CCAM now. Um, we also have a category of government member, uh, NASA is the first government member of CCAM, and uh, the rest are universities and, and industry. We currently have four uh, university members, and then the, um, you know, we have 17 industry members currently. And the, the, um, the annual fees that are paid vary on the level of membership. Uh, uh, we also had for the highest level of membership, we also defined a startup fee which was critical to us. It, it was actually how we got the funds to, to get things going before we had enough hundreds of them to able to actually sustain it. Uh, we had some startup funds that came in through those startup fees. And, and we've done exactly that same process with the Logistics Center. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've been through this now a couple of times. We had, with that one, we actually had four universities and two companies that were the founding members and created the initial organization and followed the articles and, and developed the initial bylaws and so forth. Um, and I think I think some of the keys are going to be as far as member recruitment is going to be the process that you use for determining um, you know, who you go after um, in terms of recruitment but also the process of, 
of actually board approval of those members, and whether that's a simple majority or 75 uh, percent vote required of the, the board of directors uh, uh, or the membership, whichever the case may be. What we did in both CCAM and CCALS is that uh, the board actually approves new members, so whoever the current board is at that time requires 75 percent approval to elect or bring in the new member. That's going to be especially important, I think, to the companies that are around the table, so that they, you know, there's a well-defined process for determining who's admitted to membership uh, in the consortium. And so, was your initial staff for doing that outreach was that done at the university level? Is that where the staff came from to organize those groups? No, we we uh, well, uh, yes, I mean, we did it. The universities did it. Um, Really, um, you know, or, or maybe at the companies themselves. Well, in the case, like in the case of CCAM, we had the, there were three, as I said, Marshall, UVA, and Virginia Tech, and, and each of those organizations had a person um, assigned to you know, represent them in the, in the development of the declaration. <coughs> and so that's where the initial legwork came from with, with those people. Um, and then once we, uh, and in fact, that group, and in fact, it was myself and Don Leo from Virginia Tech and, and Brian Warner from Rolls Royce were the three that then recruited the initial members to CCAM. So there were, um, after Rolls Royce, we recruited six additional members. And then at that point, we had enough resources um, through the startup fee that I mentioned that we were able to then hire an executive director and pay for an executive director. Now, some of these members were members of the board. So my expectation would be our consortium would have a board, mm -hmm. and then it would have members in addition to the board. Right. We could make up the entire consortium. That's right. And that there would be different levels of uh, whatever you want to call it, dues or fees that they are paying to run the entity and organization to facilitate moving forward with its actions and its mission, and obviously hiring an executive director. Right. So we have to first a part of what we should be doing here today too, if I understand what we're saying here correctly, is getting a sense of what companies within the state of Virginia are the most appropriate for considering to reach out to for individuals that are one, members of the board, and two, those companies which are also those companies which would be members of the consortium, which would then also fund the activity. Is that correct? Yeah. And, and that's actually, in, in the case of both CCAM and CCALS, it's only the, the top level of membership, we call it organizing, uh, we call it founding, but it's only that top level of membership that gets an appointment to the board of directors. So in the case of CCAM, we have 22 members, but uh, there are seven companies <coughs> and then four universities uh, that have appointments to the board. Because they're founding, or <coughs> they are founding, they are the ones that put the, you know, the largest amount Large of uh, resources yeah. into it uh, and commit, you know, commit people to help, help make it happen. So they actually get a seat on the board of directors. The tier two and tier three members in, in CCAM's nomenclature do not have a seat on the uh, they do have places on other committees within the organization, like the Technical Advisory Committee uh, and, and so forth, but not on the board of directors. <coughs> and could you say something about the level of uh, contributions for this income to these categories? Yeah, the, the, uh, in the case of CCAM, uh, each of the organizing members uh, pays a, a $150,000 startup fee. Mm -hmm. So that's a one time. Uh, fee. And the way that's set up, it's actually a refundable fee. So after five years, the organization, CCAM in this case, would repay that fee to those founding members. Um, so it's 150000 We We had, at the time that we did that, we had 10 members at that level because the universities contributed that, uh, that number as well. So that gave us $1.5 million to get the organization going. And then once, um, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the, the the annual member fee kicks in, which it has. The organizing industry members pay $400,000 a year uh, in a, a fee, and then the tier one members pay $400,000 a year. Tier two is $100,000 a year, and tier three is a cashless category of membership. They donate equipment, things of that sort, but they don't uh, contribute an annual fee, and as a result, don't. Uh, you know, have rights to the research output and so forth that we have. So those are the levels of membership. It's very similar then in the logistics center. Uh, it's $150,000 startup fee. It's a $300,000 annual fee 
for the organizing numbers, uh, tier one is 200,000, tier two is, is 100,000, and there's no tier three in that, in that particular organization. And the, those annual fees, by the way, I mean, the reason those are high is that that's what funds the research. And so that actually is funding research programs, and, and uh, you know, the companies are obviously participating in that. And, uh, the universities don't pay an annual fee, but they do pay that startup fee. So what is the annual fee? I'm sorry? What is the annual fee, you said? Well, the organizing industry members pay 400000 a year in an <laughs> annual fee. Yep. And they actually make a, a five-year commitment yeah, to, that, to that annual fee. <laughs> yeah. um, well, in as much as we won't be doing research, I can't imagine if we would need that, that level I wouldn't of think support. So. I wouldn't think so I'm either. not so sure we'd be so successful if we, as we expect to be, if we require <laughs> that level of support. Well, why, um, well, yeah. why? It's very difficult. Uh, I think we're going to have to acknowledge that we're going to be creating a, a dues or fee structure that's consistent and commensurate with the activities that are going to be conducted by the consortium. Uh, recognizing, acknowledging that we're going to need startup uh, monies from those founding members. So, I, that was pretty much the notes I was writing before you started was that I was thinking we would have some number of founding consortium members who would then have seats on the board who would pay more for those seats and also be a part of the startup activity and then the subsequent members coming in from those entities and organizations that wish to play a role in this in the state of Virginia would then have maybe a different dues or fee structure and could decide if they wanted to pay enough to have a seat on the board or not. I think I agree with Don. I think it, it, to me, if, if an organization wants to contribute and be a major player, should be allowed, irrespective of founder or not founder. You see what I'm saying? Because otherwise, we're preventing ourselves of growing and, and engaging others. I think that would be. Yeah, and I, I agree. I mean, I, 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 I would. I would. I would never dream that the, the fees that we would be talking about would be <laughs> large, as I mentioned. I understand. It's a very different, it's a very different organization because it has a very so active and, and all the research. You know, in, on, in our case, it's very low. Uh, in a way, we have only one time membership fee, $10,000, one tier one, and then we have two other tiers, uh, 5000 and 1000 something like this. And these are the other two can have representative as a group on the board. You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, rather than sure. I, I do think one thing we need to be you know, very careful to talk about, though, is a sustainable model. Absolutely. Because if you end up hiring an executive director and you're going to have significant expenses associated yeah. with that, you've got to have a way to sustain sure. that. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have you know, two, three years down the road, you're going to be running around with your hand out trying to find some way to generate monies to sustain it. Jim Whiteberry, you're going to be happy to know that you're going to be responsible to work with us to help us develop the articles and the process. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm happy to do that. Great. I'm happy to do that. Well, I, you know, and, and fortunate enough, my, my understanding is that if Virginia wins the national championship in basketball, you're going to donate $5 million. <laughs> 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 um, Only if I win Warren Buffett's billion dollar perfect <laughs> yeah. contest. <laughs> That would be good. Maybe we need to put an entry on the part on the behalf of the consortium <laughs> authority for that. <laughs> but that would be great. I think that's something we're going to need to be able to move forward. But if you look at the special committee meeting in your first three, it says amend, recommend articles of corporation. But we don't have those. Yeah, yet. we don't have those. Yeah. Um, yeah. And do you anticipate we'll have that? Um, and we will certainly have something to circulate before the April meeting. Okay. Um, so that we can offer them up. We may not have all the blanks filled in because again. For instance, as the founding consortium members who are to be recruited develop um, board members, uh, tiers of membership, dues levels, those are the sorts of things that you may want to include in the Articles of Incorporation. Um, it, you may not put the numbers in there, you may just say there shall be three tiers of membership or you know, but you may want to put some of those in the articles. You don't have to. It's not required. So that's um, something that the founders, me founding uh, members can discuss. Maybe by April we'll have a couple of those. Um, well, that was uh, what I was hoping. If we could, you know, if you take the steps things, if we get those articles of incorporation and we work with the founding members we're getting ready to identify some sense of, which is the next step, founding board and member proposal that we need to establish 
some guidance and they can decide what they want. If they want to call it founding and then and two of the notes I wrote down in some places you have supporting and promoting, whatever tier two and tier three level they want to call it, that's their call. As long as they acknowledge and recognize the need to have it, which I can't imagine they would not. But assuming they started off with founding, which is the word we keep using, then we would need to have founding board and member proposal, which means we need to identify <coughs> a list of organizations in the, in the state of Virginia, and then from that, identify those individuals in those organizations that would be founding board um, members. Although presumably, and question down the table and to Barry, are your members listed as people or just as organizations? Organizations. Okay. Yeah, the same with us. Yeah, organizations. Well, that's and so the individual sense. representing the organization can change. Yeah, they can. Uh, the organization appoints okay. the person to represent it. Now it can change any time that organization wants to change. Does anybody on the authority have a problem with us having the board member identification be an organization instead of an individual? No. I think that's the right way to do it. I agree. I just want to make sure that. We're not just pushing this through and some of you are sitting there going, what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, well then with that, with it's the case. Some then. are appointed to the board uh, representing federal institutions, for example, in my case. Yes. So this the is lab. appointed by the director, but not from the institution. How do you differentiate this? Uh, oh. Yeah. Well, I think the the organization or entity that joined that, that pays the money to be but a member. You're talking about a, a the consortium. The consortium, okay. yes. Right. And the consortium? members of the authority are not eligible okay. to to be um, the representatives to the consortium. So I said that. I thought I said that. Yes. You did. If you're <laughs> on the authority, you cannot be in the consortium. Your organization that you represent could have an individual. Sure, sure. Uh, in representing your organization as a consortium member, but sure, you sure. yourself cannot. Sure, sure. So that would mean that arguably we need to now start thinking about which organizations are the best ones, the most appropriate ones for starting to, to um, dialogue with about consideration to become founding uh, board members, if you will, founding board organizations. So I'm going, while I have some ideas, I'm just going to throw it at the table. Which organizations <laughs> do you think we should be talking to? Are you just going to make the just, same list we have here? Well, <laughs> I, I, was, I was actually going to make um, a point that I think this is the opportunity to bring people in who, you know, the authority had a limited number of, of members, and you couldn't have an infinite number of seats, I think number it's of seats five on to the nine, authority. Right? So, this is the opportunity to bring in folks um, maybe who didn't get appointed to the authority or aren't represented on the authority. Um, and remember that we're talking public and private uh, higher ed. We're talking not-for-profits. There are, there are uh, advocacy organizations, not like yours, not-for-profits. Um, there are others that might want to be a part of this. Um, and then also businesses and supply chain businesses and um, you know, related energy uh, companies who might also want to be a part of this. So I'm hoping that the authority folks, while they should certainly be high on the list of first consortium organization members, um, would also help us generate a pretty good list of others that we ought to reach out to and who ought to be. I mean, I was very interested, Barry, in your comment that you went from, what was it, three founding members of CMAC to now 20 or 22. Yeah. yeah, but how many of them are founding member level? There are um, seven, I thought you said seven like companies and four, and four universities. universities. Okay. Uh, NASA is actually a government member. The government members have to be handled a little bit differently yeah. because of federal procurement yeah. guidelines. Um, for example, they can't have a vote on board of directors or any of the bodies that they sit on. They can be there and participate and be a member. And, and so, uh, they expect to also pay membership to you? Uh, that. Okay, that's, that's what I'm trying to that. get at. Yeah. 
Yeah, they can't, uh, you can't get, you can't have them pay a fee without going through a procurement process. And so the, the way you set it up was that it's a non, you know, non-paying. But they do have the option.